Hey church, another midweek video for you. Again, the purpose of these videos is that they would help us become better doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. Having said that, let's just hop right into it. Last week, we went through uh, Revelation 16, 17, 18, um, and we, we, we skimmed a lot, but we really focused on Revelation 17, where Jesus shows us a picture of what he calls the great harlot. And the great harlot is something that he paints in scripture as the, the, the influence. It's a symbolic picture of what Paul calls in Ephesians 6, powers and principalities. They are demonic rulers that actually have a, a, a right to be there and for the moment until Jesus crushes them all. Um, but they have a right to be there and they operate on this world, not in like a... Um, a mystical way, but very much in like the Bible says, the devil has methods that he uses and that these powers and principalities are over entire nations, over entire regions. Um, and they are what's behind some of just the overall oppression that we feel on a day to day basis. But when we get into Revelation 17, we see that this Revelation 17 harlot is actually the mother of all abominations the mother of all harlots. And what that means, it's a spiritual term for those who, who forsake their, their covenant with Christ. It's for those who, who forsake God and, and, and instead worship another. Those who, that's why the Bible talks about, you know, when, when you don't follow God, it calls those adult, adulterers. And so we see that all of that has its foundation in this this spiritual principality of the harlot the babylon it says it even says in revelation um 18 that all unclean spirits all birds which is a metaphor for those who who take the word of god from people those who deceive people those who 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 snatch the life of of god out of out of well from people um that all of these spirits they have their foundation in this beast or i'm sorry in this harlot and so we talked about what does that look like you know, do we see it in our own country? And absolutely we do. Um, and, and often it can look a lot of different ways. But the, the number one thing I would encourage you to look to look at the sermon. The number one thing that I want us to sit with is the reality that this principality is painted in, in two ways that are very um, deceptive to us. One, uh, she's painted as a seductive harlot, so so a prostitute, um, and and the very nature of a prostitute is to seduce someone who is who is supposed to be committed to to one person. The the harlot is to seduce that person away. And the other way that that's that that it's symbolized is this great city of Babylon. And why that's so important is we have to understand that when we're dealing with with spiritual aspects of our life when we're dealing with spiritual warfare we can't think that the enemy is going to come to us with red tights on and horns and we're going to be able to spot them out and the only people somehow that are following the devil are the ones who just like demonic stuff that's not how the bible presents it that's not how we're presented with this harlot it's this beautiful harlot that's dressed in in, in fine clothes and jewelry it's it, it's supposed to be something that we look at and we and there's something about her that we want my hope is last week that as we went through the message that the Holy Spirit would enlighten something in your heart that would that he would be telling you be careful because this desire is something that this harlot is trying to seduce you away from God with. That's my hope. That's plain and simple. That's my challenge is as we go through this, when we see that this harlot is a seductress and we have to be honest with ourselves because in order to be seduced, there has to be something in you that wants what they have. So maybe it's not sin. Maybe it's not sin. Maybe it's a life of comfort. Maybe it's maybe it's money. Maybe it's who knows. I, I'm praying even right now, Holy Spirit, would you please enlighten us? Show us those places where the enemy has um, what you would call in your word uh, an opportunity for a foothold where they can begin to grab a piece of our heart that we know that if we were to go this way, we might get what we want. The other way that it's presented is Babylon. Babylon is is was this great city of they I mean they excelled in everything in wealth, intelligence, power. They were things that when the world looked at Babylon, they said, I like this, I want that. It's this picture of worldliness that we just can be in love with. It even says in Revelation 18 that when Jesus destroys this great harlot, the nations actually weep because the harlot was making them rich. And so again, as we see that, we have to understand that Jesus is trying to tell us that we are not going to be led astray because all of a sudden we wake up and we just decide we want to follow the devil. 
We know that scripture says there's a great apostasy coming, a great falling away in the last days. These are not going to be people who just decide, you know what, I like evil stuff. Or even people, maybe some, but there's going to be a lot of people who aren't going to say, oh, I just like sin. But there's going to be something in them. Maybe it's a quest for power or control. Maybe it's a desire to be light. Whatever it may be, we have to understand from last week's message that when we see Revelation 17, that the enemy is going to come at you with a wink. He's going to come at you with a smile and holding something that you want, something that you may covet, something that that you've been asking God for and he hasn't given. And you are willing to give your will so you can give this so you can get this rather than hold on and trust God, even if you may not get it. So that's last week, this this up and coming week. We're going to continue to move forward. We're going to talk about Armageddon. But I'm actually going to focus more on how does the enemy actually gain control? Because what we see in Armageddon is this spiritual battle in this spiritual realm begins to actually come down to earth. And now there are people who are actually fighting for the beast in the physical. Now, depending on what you believe, um, we, we know that most scholars believe at this point, the church may not even be here, at least not at least not us, not not the people who are here now. You know, God will still be saving people, but the church may not be here. So what does this even really have to do with us? Are we just reading this because it's interesting? I don't think so. I think we're reading this because in this, what we're going to see in Revelation 17, 18 and 19, I think we are going to see a picture of how the enemy actually gains more and more control. I think there's an there's an actual there's an actual method there that we can look in the future and see, okay, this is an interesting story, but I think it has, it has so great effect on how we live our lives now. So this next sermon, we're going to be talking about Yes, Armageddon, but also, again, we're going to be revisiting power and principalities. And most importantly, two things, we're going to see how does the enemy gain ground in our life and how does Christ have victory over that? And how do we stand in that? So I'm looking forward to this week. Hope you guys are doing great. This is a a really important message. I I would encourage you, especially for those of you who are just not doing well spiritually, resist the temptation to miss this message. I believe that there are there's opportunities for bondages to be broken just from hearing what the Lord has from us here for us here on this next sermon. Love you guys. And I will see you Sunday. God bless.